Hey everyone. So today I'm going to interview um, in a little while Dylan Brown. He's going to join us. He is um, kind of like a leader of this new movement of um, found footage films, really good ones as well. Low budget found footage films through um, horror nerds productions, horror dads productions. Uh, he's a producer, he's a director, he's a writer. He, he's bringing a lot of people together. He works as well uh, helping um, veterans with PTSD. They're, they're often in his films, which is really admirable. He's been really successful. You can, If you search Dylan Brown on Tubi, you'll find all his films. Um, I'm a massive fan, as you'll hear in the interview, of Tahoe Joe. I think that's a brilliant film. Um, he's done twenty three. He's been involved in twenty three different titles and different roles, um, whilst working a nine to five. Um, Ghost is his latest film for you to check out. I tell one one thing as well: the artwork for these films is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, so yeah, Dylan Brown interview now or soon. <laughs> okay, Dylan, thank you so much for joining us on Puggle Three Sixteen Channel Horror Plus. It's an absolute privilege to spend time with you. Thanks so much. I'm excited. I think this is like, um, I think I was on one other international podcast and uh, everything else has been mm -hmm. stateside. So uh, I'm excited to be like, you know, broadcast worldwide here. So it's super fun. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I mean, and that's it. It's such a, and as I'm finding, the more that I do this, and it is such a community of people, isn't it? The horror community. And you know what excites me about the things that you're doing is your yours is so all inclusive, and in terms of the people you're working with, you you're really bringing people up around you and with you, um, and including people and inviting people in. And I've noticed that with people you work with as well. Um, and I, hopefully, you're, well, we did have a little chat before, so I won't. Um, you know, you're okay to kind of go chronologically through some of your films that you've directed because I know you've been involved in so many titles. I think it'll probably more than more than 23 that's listed, probably a lot more because you're you're constantly making uh, and creating, <laughs> um, which is amazing. Um, so, if we can kind of start off, I think it kind of makes sense to start off with Devil's Children. Yeah, I, I I'd never heard of a reno murder house so my first question was like the inspiration behind that is there a real was that a real thing like a kind of local legend um just tell me a little bit about that film because it's, it's straight away it's found you're, you're in the found foot very much in the found footage um subgenre of horror what inspired you to to make that leap with that film so you know the devil's children is such a funny story and it's uh i've told this one a couple times um, and it's really going to segue to the next one, which is the flock. And so I'm just going to kind of do yeah, that yeah, seamlessly, nice. um, mm -hmm. because essentially the devil's children was a cut scene from the original flock script. So right. what happened was I was really wanting to make films. I, I had made a couple of fun, um, just little cell phone video things for some filmmaker challenges locally. Yeah. And uh bloody disgusting covered one of them that the big horror website uh, yeah dot com yeah it's so one website. of them was like a a tremors fan film with the big sandworms you know uh, oh wow and so tremors takes place in nevada and so for us over here in, in reno and nevada it's like a big movie franchise yeah. um so i went out i messed around i made this little fan film you know and bloody disgusting covered it it brought all these eyes onto my youtube channel and i thought well if there's ever a time to maybe go make a feature film, it seems like right now is the time. Yeah. So I wrote this flick or this script called the flock. And I'm like, mm -hmm. after it was done, I'm like, bro, there's no way you can film this. Like you don't have enough equipment. You don't have enough connections. Um, but I was, kept looking at this one sequence and it was this sequence at a party where these kids kind of unwittingly release this demon and it gets them connected to all this other stuff going on. And I kept thinking, you know, well, I don't really need to show the party sequence in the flock. It doesn't need to be there. It could just sort of be alluded to. But then I thought, well, if I'm going to make my first movie, what if I just take that cut scene and stretch that into its own story? Right. And that's a little more manageable. You know, it's got a, a smaller cast. It's got far less uh, plot devices. Uh, and so I got all prepped and then 
COVID hit. And so like wow. everything was shut down and the original place I wanted to shoot the movie, I couldn't go shoot it. Uh, the camera crew that I was really hoping to work with, they were like really freaking out. They were, they were all sick at the time I had reached out. So none of them wanted anything to do with work. Um, but I was home because we were on leave for work for a while and I had nothing to do for like a month. And I thought, well, I have a camera. I have some people who are really hungry. They haven't worked in a while. Some uh, a lot of theater kids, and so you know, the first thing they got shut down was stage plays and stuff like that. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. And so they were excited, and I was like, "Hey, this is going to be weird. There's not a huge script. Uh, you're going to be doing a lot of improv. Um, mm -hmm. If we shoot it found footage style, I can really be in there with the camera. We can forget about all of the the stuff that you know you have to normally worry about. We can." We can have shadows in the shot or we can have a reflection like who cares it's raw footage it's supposed to be like that yeah so that's, yeah that's kind of why found footage became my thing it was sort of just out of necessity at the time yeah um and so it's we inspired to... sorry go ahead no i was oh, just no, gonna I say was... it's inspired so many other people in your group and other you know it, it, there's, there's so many people surrounding you now making found footage from that kind of from that decision that you made for practical reasons yeah it's it's so funny um and and here's the really funny thing about found footage is it it does it's got this like double-edged sword one side of it says anybody can grab a camera and make something in the genre because it's it's mm -hmm. okay to be raw it's part of the it's part of it you know it's not a found footage film if it doesn't have those cameraman reflections in the mirror or that really in-world camera feel but Conversely, as I've been learning, as we've been getting more and more complicated and, and with bigger and bigger films, it's a lot harder than a normal production because I'm sort of stuck with like one camera angle with whoever has the camera at the time. So if we need to pull off a special effect, it has to be done in camera from that one perspective. I can't do the very famous, you know, uh, a knife comes at the character and then cut away to an up close shot of the knife going yeah. in and then coming back out again. We have to pull it all off in one angle because there's only one viewpoint. So oh, yeah. effects wise found footage is very tough. And I've been telling new filmmakers, if you're going to get into the genre, don't get super complicated yet because it actually becomes very, very expensive to make effects yeah. work in this genre. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Cause I know you and I have talked about host, and they are very economic with the effects and how they do them. And I was thinking about the the bathtub scene in Devil's Children. So you, you've got quite a narrow window for that to it has to look right straight away. And it does, and it's it's quite it, it has that shocking effect. Tell me a little bit about that bathtub scene because that's is that that's practical effects, you yeah. know, and in, in your first movie that you're gonna have to kind of like you say, you're gonna hit the ground running. <laughs> So what we did, this was such like a cheap way out, right? I'm totally going to like dox myself here. <laughs> but we were we were trying to figure out how are we going to do some of these things um, in, in world, in camera, found footage style. Mm -hmm. Well, I've always sort of been kind of a rebel and not really wanted to follow a lot of rules. And I thought, well, who says that the rule book, you know, for found footage says that the entire movie has to be found footage. So... I had this idea where since since in the devil's children, it's kind of told in two parts. You have like the girl V being interviewed by the film mm -hmm. students and she's recalling the story. And then you have like the raw footage that they watch that she brings them on the camera card and says like, well, here's that card that the police never got. Uh, so you can see like what really happened. So I thought if she's retelling the story, why don't we just go ahead in those moments where she's telling things, just film those like a traditionally shot thing. We don't really have to worry about who's holding the camera. Let's just recreate those moments. Uh, like documentaries do all the time. Somebody will be recalling an event and they recreate yeah, it. Yeah, right. Sure. So that's how we went about a couple of scenes in that movie. And uh, the bathtub scene was one of them, but it was a, a great effect. So what we did was we yeah, took, it was. we took an old, um, pregnancy belly that people would wear to simulate a pregnancy and it was made out of styrofoam okay. so i cut a big hole in it and the actress put it on and so it was hollow inside and we taped a big plastic bag in there to hold all this goop and we filled it with fake blood 
and we put inside of it a whole uh, squid that we bought from like an Asian food market. <laughs> no way. <laughs> and so when she reaches in, she's able to pull out all those tentacles, you know, and this oh, baby wow. squid thing. And uh, oh my it was way. hilarious. Like <laughs> it, oh, it was such a funny <laughs> sequence. We're all dying laughing. Um, oh my word. And, that was really, uh, really stood out for me, that scene. And, yeah, and, you know, and yeah, it's it's a goofy movie, right? I, I will say it first and foremost. I, I didn't know what I was really doing. We ran out of time. Very amateur stuff going on. But I do think that that bathtub sequence was where it told me, hey, you do have the ingenuity to figure some stuff out. Yeah. And, 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 and also it's my favorite you, part of the movie, too. Oh, good. Oh, cool. Because that's it. I mean, you take those parts and then you run with them in your next movie. You go, oh, that worked really well. In the same way as, you know, and I think this is maybe just a common personality trait of anybody creative is that we, I say we, uh, you know, we people who, who who have a creative bone in their body, they tend to think, oh, I, I've got to focus on the things I didn't do well. And but when you can kind of hold on to one or two things and take them with you onto your next piece of writing or your next movie or whatever it is, it it, it makes that even more worthwhile. Because when you do move on to the flock, um, some of the characters, obviously, now you've explained why that is, some of the characters um, overlap. And also what I thought was different about the, the flock was that the conversations in the car, it reminded me a little bit of dash cam. It had that kind of... Um, interplay between the characters a little bit more you were you were kind of like you said yourself it's a little bit more fleshed out um mm -hmm. in in terms of the, the flock what were your kind of ideas behind that what did you want to do because i got a, a sort of things like um red stay or cults and manson family kind all that kind of thing all squished together what was what was your thoughts be, behind that the, the flock originally what did you want to put up on the screen so the flock really was a kind of a stab at um, fake cultists, you know, like like um, these guys, Crow in, in the flock, the main bad guy. He's mm -hmm. like a complete, you know, farce. He's like the Wizard of Oz, really. He's just a man behind a curtain. And so I wanted to play with the idea of cults using social media, which yeah. it, it kind of hit. Um, I have a, a stepson. And when I was making the flock, he was about eight years old. And, I, and it hit me when I was kind of listening to some of the YouTube videos he was watching. And some of these YouTubers, it's very easy for them to indoctrinate children into their beliefs. It's, oh, for sure. And so for you sure. put flashy stuff on the screen and you, you sort of talk about characters and cartoons that they like. But then you have these like hidden kind of messages about, you know, tell your mom and dad that you want to drink my favorite brand of energy drink and kids should like <laughs> energy drinks. They're good. Oh, and man. I was seeing that stuff and I thought, what if a cult leader did the same thing? Mm -hmm. And you've got all these kids who are on TikTok or Instagram or YouTube and they're, they're 16, 17, 18 years old and they're lost kind of in life. Maybe they're struggling with, uh, you know, personal or, or gender or sexual identity or something. And they have that thing going on. Or maybe they were suicidal at some point. They, all these yeah. people with like a, a dark cloud of not really knowing who they can go to, to yeah they're struggling yeah. yeah so then you have these people preying on those types right and saying join us join this join the flock join this group where you can be you know whoever you want to be and they're using social media to kind of get the word out uh which is why we made all those fake sort of um you know uh i don't know what the word would be um recruitment like promos yeah, yeah. Pro recruitment yeah it's a bit like um for the wrestling fans that are like AEW with the uh, Dark Order, you know, like there's a yes. like join that and it flashes up on the screen, join Dark Order. And that, that kind of gave me that same sort of vibe, you know. Um, yeah, it, it, it's great to kind of do that. I suppose that goes back to Blair, Blair Witch were doing that kind of viral marketing before it was even called viral marketing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so uh, funny. If you, then anytime you talk about found footage, it's like if you, if you chip away all the way down to like the root of what you're doing, it's like, it always leads back to the Blair Witch, which I think is yeah. so cool that it's, it's yeah, such sure. a simple movie devoid of like any special effects. Um, but all of the, all of the things we do still seem to kind of stem, you know, from that Genesis, which is, is really cool.
it is really cool, isn't it? Because it's such a, it, at the time it was such a divisive film because people oh. weren't weren't used to seeing the the angles, the movement, the production value or lack of. And I, I I've said this before, and I said this to to um, Jed Shepard because he was talking about Host and his you know love of Blair Witch. And for me, Blair Witch, I watched in the cinema. People got up and booed at the end of it when I saw, and I'd never seen that in a cinema before, and I thought it was so strange. Um, because they just didn't know how to react. I think yeah. they were either going to absolutely love it or absolutely hate it. And for those people who love it, it's it's like ground zero of of their filmmaking careers. And I didn't, I don't think I realized that until I started speaking to people like yourselves how influential it was. Um, and and you can see it shows people that you can do this yourself as well. Like it gives you that kind of hope that you you don't have to have a multi-million pound production deal to make a film yeah absolutely and i think uh so i was probably i think i was around eighth grade when the blair witch project came out and for me i was right around the age where i'm believing anything you know at mm. this point if it's if it's making news and it's saying it's real um i'm i'm at the age where like okay this is real so when that movie came out uh, my parents, you know, no way, you're not going to watch it. I mean, in fact, we had teachers were like warning, you know, putting out a warning, like, don't let your kids see this. You know, it's this real footage. And all these people in my little small town I grew up in, they were basically convinced that the Blair Witch Project was like a snuff film or something that was. Right, yeah. It makes really you want really to really see it. even more. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. So we're like, what is this? It's this real footage. Uh, but I remember a couple of my friends going. And I just remember them coming to school and there was like two very different reactions, like he said, the, the divisiveness. There was one group of friends who had seen it saying, you know, that was the dumbest thing I've ever seen. You don't <laughs> see anything. It was boring. I got motion sickness, you know, it's just silly. Yeah. The other side were kids who were so traumatized because they for sure thought they saw footage of three people dying. And I think they thought, uh, yeah, it's not even that they thought. I just think that the idea was planted in their heads that they saw more than they actually did. Yes. So for them, they were fully traumatized, right? You know, like they've witnessed murder footage and they never want to go camping again. And so it was like those two different sides. Um, yeah. Strange. And then when that? I finally saw the movie, I was actually on the side of the disappointed side. I was like, what? You know, there's no cool witch. Like, where's the creature? Same. Effect? same i was exactly the same yeah right and then I wasn't when ready i got for older, it <laughs> exactly uh and when i got older i started to realize all of the things that uh eduardo sanchez and company did when they made that movie and it was it was basically the build up um more than the movie itself i think it yes. was the fact that they told all those actors to stay out of the limelight um, to not book any projects for a year, to stay off of, you know, message boards when this thing was being broadcast virally. And so because there was no information uh, and you couldn't find these people, I started to realize like they played that so perfectly because it they lived the, the story for like a year until the movie came out. And then the fact that it was made for I don't know. I mean, it's always kind of a weird thing. I see so many different numbers on what exactly yeah. it cost. But I'd say I think the safe to safest bet is like around, you know, with marketing and stuff, it's probably like a thirty thousand dollar effort, you know. And it yeah. made like, you know, fifty million dollars or some crazy thing. It's like one of the biggest leaps from budget to to what it actually made ever. And yeah. so that's when I really started to appreciate what they did. Um, yeah certainly the marketing of it yeah yeah this is it and i think i i didn't get i was exactly the same as you i didn't get it straight away um and i think as well this you, you with marketing things like that it, the people who are warning you against it it's so counterintuitive to what they want you, yeah. they're, they're doing such a great job in terms of marketing that film i mean I, i'm i'm a bit older and and I, my thing wasn't so much that at our local church it was more uh, Dungeons and Dragons, people getting up and crying and screaming about, you'd think it was like some sort of Southern Baptist, you know, American <laughs> thing, but it wasn't. It was like, you know, little little old England and people screaming and crying about their children playing Dungeons and Dragons. 
And it just made me go, what the hell is Dungeons and Dragons and how can I get a hold yeah. of it? <laughs> well, it's like, uh, I always know the very famous thing over on your side of the pond is the video nasty era. Yeah, of course. You know? yeah. And yeah. as soon as you tell a bunch of teenagers that we're banning these films because of gratuitous violence and nudity, everybody's like, I have to see it. Like, I absolutely yeah. have to see it. And it was probably the greatest thing that could have ever happened for those movies was saying you can't watch them. Yeah, and it's still possible now. I think people think it isn't. You can't fool people. But but you can. It, it, you just got to kind of be a little a little bit more creative about it and or do it in a slightly different way. There's so many different avenues. It's funny you say about the video nasties. I, I'm doing a short series with, with a, another YouTuber, um, Al Lacard, and we're, we're going to be looking at, he started this series and we're going to continue it about video nasties and he um and, and myself we were laughing saying if one thing you want to not give to horror fans if you're trying to discourage them for something is give them a list like you give them yeah. a list they're gonna they're gonna work down that list and go through every single one yep absolutely so speaking of lists actually dylan um i'm gonna keep working through your your canon your your films because I really, really want to spend some time talking about my favorite. I'm going to say this, my favorite of yours. Um, and I do want to kind of touch on The Flock a little bit more, actually, because there's some really interesting things there. But I'm just too excited not to talk about Tahoe Joe because I <laughs> love that film. I absolutely love it. Um, when you move from Devil's Children to The Flock to Tahoe Joe, you do take all the best parts of the things you've done before with you. And I think it just works in such a creative way. Um you've got that monster movie feel, but you've also got the found footage. It's not like anything I've seen, which is a really positive thing. Tell me a little bit about the initial genesis of Tahoe Joe, because I just want people to see this movie. I think it's great. So this is such a fun movie for me too, because I, I was telling Michael Rock, our my, my co-director on that and my main star, you know, in, in most of my movies, um, I was telling him that we will probably always be the Tahoe Joe guys. Like, I think that <laughs> even when we go make, we can make a hundred other movies, but I do think that people will probably always default back to Tahoe Joe because it is the one that really put us on the map. Um, but it's such an interesting way that it all came about because we were, we were at the premiere of the flock. We were showing it at the theater. Uh, we had all the cast and crew there. And I had had a little bit of an interesting situation on the flock shoot i had some people that you know i enjoyed working with them but they were starting to get um a little bit i don't really i'm trying to think of the, the nicest way to say it there, there were some people i was working with that were getting a little bit more um i think satisfaction about just saying they were working on a movie because i had already proven i could get it out there than actually working on the movie i think they wanted to ride my success more than they actually wanted to help is what it started to feel like okay and yeah. i had some people you know it's like wait a minute you know you're so i'm bringing you in i'm i'm getting you um credits and I, i'm getting you you know stuff to build on your resume for future projects and stuff and bringing you in as a producer or a production assistant but you're not showing up to half of the shoots or you're not even promoting the movie when it's already out. You know, I'm just, I was having this really sour taste of, mm. I thought I had a really cool group of people around me. And instead I've got some people that seem to only want to talk about how they were involved with the project, but they didn't actually want to like get their hands dirty and, and work. Yeah. It's a bit Except, intoxicating, isn't it? To kind of just oh, say you're on a movie and, and not actually... It's anything. pretty much yeah. it's pretty much what was happening, you know, and uh, and then they were getting upset, you know, because I wanted to work super fast. And I was like, no, we're not going to take a break right now. Like we, we will at some point, but let's go. We're on limited time or, oh, they're whining because it's cold outside. And it's like, well, guys, of course, it's cold outside. You're an actor. You need to just we're going to get through this. We'll get warmed up in a minute. I'm out here freezing, too, you know, and yeah. I just I was like, oh, this is so frustrating. And the one guy who was very, very open to doing anything I asked and was always around was, was Michael Rock. So yeah. we're at the premiere of The Flock and I'm talking to him and he asked me, hey, do you have anything else planned for you know the future to, to do anything? And I said, well, um, I've always wanted to make a Bigfoot movie and I kind of have this idea now that I've got a couple of movies under my belt and I've met you, would you want to come in and work with it? 
And Mike started actually kind of laughing and he was, you know, I could tell he was like, oh boy, a, a low budget Bigfoot movie. That's song. <laughs> He's going to be in a costume. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm sure he was thinking that he was going to be running around like Bigfoot, you know. Yeah. Um, and so I told him, you know, hey, I have this really cool idea and we'll discuss a little more uh, after this is done and the stuff from the flock has kind of died down. So we got together and he said, you have a script. And I was like, well, um, don't run away from this, but there is no script whatsoever. And he, he's like, what? And I said, well, um, no, we're going to shoot it in real time, like a documentary, uh, completely unscripted. And it's just going to happen chronologically. Like we're going to film uh, in order until it's done. And he's like, well, I don't really understand. And I'm like, just... Uh, if you can trust me, show up on these days and uh, and you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. So he's like, yeah, OK. So I kept thinking the whole time I need to do something to get this guy hooked. Right. So I went out and I filmed my the, that opening three minutes that you see when the movie opens where I'm standing out in front of my house and it's snowing outside. And I'm talking about how unpredictable the weather is. And mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you get this transition to. um you know, I'm making a Bigfoot documentary because of this missing persons case. And then we show the Tahoe Joe credits, right? So I sent Mike that first three minutes and said, this is kind of how the film would open, just so you get an idea of what my my vision is. Mm -hmm. And he writes me back immediately and he goes, dude, I, I want more. I want to see more of this story. Like, what, uh -huh. what the hell? I didn't know that this is what you were doing. And I was like, well, yeah, I kind of want it to feel like a, like a Discovery Channel you know documentary oh man yeah i get the realism of it it's like i was trying to kind of describe it to somebody and i was saying like that it's a really good mixture of fact and fiction in the sense of like grizzly man like the documentary grizzly man but with like a bit of deliverance and a bit of grizzly and like it works really well because when we're talking about mixing real life um i think it's a, a love letter to nevada um in terms of it's really interesting to look at um but also i think the friendship you you the friendship is so genuine that's key to the success of the film would you agree on those two things the the, oh. the nevada aspects and the friendship aspect a hundred percent so one of the main things i wanted to do if i was going to make a, a movie about bigfoot especially around lake tahoe because it's just it's beautiful it's just such a famous lake mm -hmm. um I thought I have to do it justice. I have to show people that it's beautiful up here. And, um, and I kept thinking the whole, it's like the whole beauty and the beast idea, right? You know, you have the beauty yeah, of yeah. nature, but then you have this ugly beast that's, that's living in it. So um, I definitely wanted to have drone shots and big, you know, wide shots of, of the area that we live in and, and how pretty it is. But uh, you're, you're spot on with me and Mike. We got so close while making that movie that we kind of, it just turned into a thing where like now Mike's girlfriend babysits my kids like on set. She'll be there like on set watching my baby. Oh, so Mike and I can film. That's awesome, man. Um, Mike that's and so, I are... that You can see that on screen. You can really yeah. see that friendship developing. It, it feels like it's not acting, which is ideal. <laughs> yeah. We, we play off of each other so well. And I am not an actor. Mike is, but I'm not at all. So for me, having to be such a, a presence in Tahoe Joe because of, uh, you know, basically the way I wrote it, I thought, my gosh, I have a lot of sort of acting that I have to do. But because Mike was there, it was kind of like my comfort that if I started to have any sort of a moment where I was going to stumble or whatever, I knew Mike and I were so close in real life that if he started a conversation with me, it would be easy for me to get back into you know, the role or where we were at. And there was a few times where he would do that. He would, he could probably feel me starting to get into director mode more than actor mode. So he would tailor the conversation to bring me back in. And that's why I wanted Mike to just end up being a co-director because I was realizing yeah. how much I was doing so much directing with the technical side of things. And Mike was really doing this other style of directing, which was the human side that I wasn't doing. And I just felt like he can't be credited as just an actor on this. He's doing so many other things um, yeah. that I need to bring him in as a co-director. And it just, what a symbiotic relationship it's been ever since. It's been great. Oh, man. You can see that on screen, which is great. 
it, it obviously, like you say, it's improved what you're doing through that collaboration. Um, he he's certainly got a presence, and you've got I think you've got a presence of characters as well, but you've got very different, distinct personalities that work well together. For example, the scenes with the the the, the guy who um who goes out with you and he, he he starts acting yeah very strangely and your kind of unspoken looks at each other and kind of how, working out what to do protecting each other but also kind of working out the next steps is really well done and and I think it'd be hard to do that if you if you were just like two complete strangers who just met. Um, Michael's got a real presence, hasn't he? With that kind of um, obviously he he was special forces, wasn't he? So he's like um, you know got that kind of comfort with physicality, I guess. Um, yeah, it works. And, and and obviously you're 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 in your native area. You're in your place that you feel very comfortable. But I did feel. Like the space is quite scary as well, isn't it? If you don't know it, like dropping somebody like me in there would be a death sentence. <laughs> <laughs> like just a guy who knows nothing about looking after himself. So, like, it was that was that key as well to kind of make it very clear that it's not just a pretty place; it's somewhere where you have to get your hands dirty to survive. Absolutely. Um, you know, I grew up in a, in a really small town. Um, and I grew up fishing and hunting and, uh, and hiking and enjoying the outdoors. But I also, and so, so I knew that there were dangers, you know, even as a small child, I knew there were dangers outside things like what we have over here are mountain lions and bears. Uh, so there are animals that can eat you, you know, you have to be very careful. Um, conversely, you have Mike who, like you said, you know, Mike was a green beret and, and for, years he was putting himself in the most danger a human being could be in which is in you know the middle of war so for him it's like danger is just kind of a a byproduct of his career right it's something that he expects things that he's going to run into and he doesn't really freak out because he's been there and he knows that panicking makes things worse on my side I don't tend to usually have too many freakouts in my real life in a situation like being out in the woods either, because I've been there a lot. I understand. Uh, I'm really good with directions. So it's, it's actually difficult for me to, to kind of get lost. I can usually find my way back anywhere. Um, but when we made the movie, I thought, well, both of us can't be that way because then it doesn't really have any tension. So I had to sort of swallow my pride and kind of be the one that was a little more focused on the filmmaking side and not so good in the outdoors, just so I had a reason to like, yeah, that, split needs, up or yeah, that needs to be there. Doesn't it? Yeah. 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 And so it it was kind of a sting, you know, to the old manly uh, ego that I had to say <laughs> like, yeah, okay, I'm going to be the one that makes the wrong turn here and gets lost. And, um, but it also was, was a lot of fun because we've we've been able to play up on those moments as well with us as kind of these characters who uh, are almost got uh, this Mulder and Scully aspect, you know, where we're we're investigating the same strange thing or or occurrences or whatever, uh, putting ourselves in danger. But there's like two different ways of going about it. You know, there's like the the hard believer uh, and and you know probably more rough and tough type, and then there's the the skeptic and the more like I'm, I'm going to be better on the backside of this thing. So that's kind of how we played up our characters for the documentary stuff is that Mike's going to be the one that's going to be first to say, yes, I'll dive head first into the situation. And I would be the character that would be a little more apprehensive and wanting to get the best footage of it to prove to the public, you know, that this is a real thing. Whereas, you know, Mike's like, well, I'll prove to the public that he's real. I'll just shoot Bigfoot, you know, I'll take him back on my truck. (laughs) I'll just do it. You know, Um, and so it's like, it's been fun because I'm not necessarily playing a hundred percent myself in the movie, but it works for the film to play that way. So, uh, mm. we I think that makes sense. Though. I think, yeah, yeah, I think that makes perfect sense to have that distinction between the characters. Um, but also it, it moves you on a little bit. So um, when we, when we get to go still kind of see, you know, your kind of role in that. And I think, you can see bit by bit how more comfortable you feel doing that and how you add those little wrinkles into your characters. Um, 
the 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 character um Jaden wasn't it who 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 wouldn't get out of the car wouldn't engage didn't want to he's at the other end of that spectrum he if you're kind of in the middle and Michael's at the other end <laughs> then he's as far away from wanting to get out of that car uh, as possible it makes sense because I won't go into I don't want to go into spoiler territory but like it, it kind of makes sense. Tell me a little bit about his character because he's a really interesting character. Obviously, he's got the, the the issues with his throat. Obviously, it's very much almost like a buddy film. Uh, you, you've got a few people who come and go, but you you two are the core of the film. Well, tell me a little bit about his character. So Jalen is uh, Jalen. He... Sorry, yeah. Jaylen, oh no, yeah, Jaylen. you're fine. He's um, he's friends with in real life. He's friends with Mike's son, Michael Junior. They're they're buddies. Uh, Jalen was born with a, a condition that caused him to have um, problems with breathing. So he needed to have a trach tube put in. Um, so he breathes through the, the tube in his throat. Uh, his lung capacity is weakened. So it helps him draw in more air that way. Right. Um, he had wanted to get involved in the movie stuff. But obviously, when you have speech problems because of a throat issue like that, it's very hard to find a role for somebody that has a hard time speaking. And especially when it can get very hard to hear what they're saying. And mm -hmm. Mike and I, you know, we kept saying like, we want to be inclusive. We want anybody who wants to be involved in a movie to have a way to be involved. And so we thought, mm -hmm. well, what if we bring in Jalen as Toma's son and Jalen goes looking for his dad at one point and he gets injured. And this throat thing now is a result of like an attack by Tahoe Joe himself. This gives us the workaround without having to explain some sort of long backstory on Jalen being born with the condition, yeah, but it yeah. adds a sense of realism as to how dangerous Certainly. it is to go out there. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, I couldn't take my, my eyes off him because he was so affected by what had happened to him. You know, it, it, there was some real, he, he was real emotions in there. I, I really felt for him because he, he was kind of sharing his, his pain and his loss and his you know, yeah yeah you know, frustration. So, the really funny thing about it is, uh, I think Jalen's fear was mostly because there was a camera in his face, but it worked for the film. It worked. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was very much that. That kid was so nervous the day we were shooting. He was shaking at one point. You know, we kept telling him, "Hey, bro, it's fine. Nobody's gonna know if you mess up because I can cut this footage out. Nobody's gonna know. It's me, you, and Mike. That's it." So eventually, he he came into his own, but. Uh, a lot of his fear, I think, was like actually really nervous, uh, but it worked because we needed that character to be that way. Um, yeah, yeah, it works really well. I mean, I, I th th there's so many elements of it of, of the film that come together in that in that way, and it's not, you know, sometimes people when they sort of being putting themselves down, they go, "Oh, that just happened," or whatever. But it doesn't. A lot of thought and time and uh, and creativity goes into making these these things work and i think his character works really well like i said the the the, the burgeoning friendship between yourself and michael um the, the the mixture of kind of real and 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 um fiction like non-fiction and fiction is a really creative and interesting way and um again like i go back to it, i think the friendship is the key but there's so much spinning off that so I was going to ask you about it later, but there is going to be a Tahoe Joe too, isn't there? Yes. In fact, I'm uh, the camera is not looking at it, but I am looking directly at our new and improved Tahoe Joe creature suit oh, that I'm man. building in the in my studio right now, um, oh, and cool. uh, it's going to be excellent. We we were able to significantly increase the budget which just means a much better monster this time and that's pretty much where we've dumped all the money mike and i want to keep the movie organic and and everything like the first one was so really when we had opportunities with some producers who said we want to you know back this movie and send some funds because they really like the first one too the first thing mike and i said was well the only things we'll spend money on are upgrading camera equipment so we can shoot a, a higher quality film and and upgrading the monster suit and making a, a more kind of hollywood level creature effect other than that we don't want to do anything else because we don't want it to feel you know like a, a movie per se we want it to have that feeling that the first one did that was like the, yeah. the documentary so yeah, uh, non-fiction feel yeah it really yeah. does have a yeah it really does have that feel and i think that works so well 
Yeah, uh, so that's really the second one's going to be the same way. Uh, we have a really, really awesome story that's going to take all of those uh, and and like you said, it, with for the sake of not spoiling anything, but all of those uh, elements at the end of the film that are like kind of like what the heck is going on. We're expanding on that really big in the sequel. Um, but the way we've written the sequel is that by the time you finish the second movie, you will watch the first movie differently because of right. some things going oh, on cool. that will actually make you, when you go back to watch the first movie, you'll actually see some things that you probably would have never thought about uh, in this in, uh, until you've seen the second one. So I think it's going to make a, a really fun double feature because we're going to revisit some things from the first film, but it's not just a revisit, it's an expansion. Right, because it is whole, like you, I think, like you said, um, you know, it, it is wholly believable. So to hold on to that is 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 going to be quite tricky and still upgrade it at the same time and kind yeah. of enhan enhance certain things. Um, and, and for people who haven't seen the film, um, this isn't like Suburban Sasquatch, if anyone's seen it. This isn't like, you know... A, this this is a very economic use of the of the of the characters and actually by the way can i just say i love suburban sasquatch as well but in for completely different reasons um <laughs> just from fun from point of view like but yeah. um it, it, it it's that kind of economy it's a bit like i always go but when i use those examples i always think of like jaws you know like if they use too much of that shark people start picking holes in it um literally it would start falling apart but um it was yeah, it's that kind of idea of economy uh, it, it equals fear sometimes as well. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's um, yeah. So, so for people, I just I just want people to watch that first one, and then I can't wait to see the second one. I'm really excited for that, and, and I'm kind of interested in the research element of the films. This is why I want to kind of nip, nip back to um, the flock a little bit because in the flock. There's demonology, there's that Moloch character, the in Saho Joe, there's the kind of history of um, you know, what that area and, and and the different sort of myths in that area. In terms of research, do do you stick your head in a book and really go into it, or is it just things that you're interested in anyway? Um a lot of them are just things that sort of spawn from as we're writing the story, we'll go, you know, maybe that deserves a little more uh mm -hmm. expansion so then we'll go and we'll do a little research and then sometimes that changes you know what we're doing because we're like ah, actually maybe that doesn't quite fit the bill or we'll say oh that's actually really cool let's actually go further into that uh but like in the flock with Moloch, i was literally just looking for biblical demons and i read up on this this demon of Moloch that uh had this horrifying thing of you know child sacrifice and i thought well since we're doing this whole thing with you know, basically uh, teens and stuff being indoctrinated into this cult. Like, of course, the demon that they would probably raise would be some sort of child sacrifice type thing. So that's why in the flock, Moloch could only be brought forth, you know, by a child sacrifice, which which happens at some point. I won't explain exactly how, but um, so with that one, that's kind of why we went with that particular demon. It was just, ooh, it was so eerie and freaky to me that I thought, perfect, he's great. Um <laughs> Tahoe Joe is an interesting one because the actual Tahoe Joe myth in, that, that originally started was Tahoe Joe was a mountain man that lived in the woods and he basically uh, used to run er, uh, up and down the mountains stealing supplies from like armies when there was this big war going on in Nevada, right? He was just oh, like wow. a guy that lived out in the woods. But somewhere down the line, I think somebody misinterpreted a story about a guy who wore like animal furs. And they misinterpreted uh, it as like a guy covered in fur. And then it turned into like a Bigfoot story somehow. And they started calling yeah. it that same name. Uh, so oh I just sort of made my own kind of take on that. I, there's really no written anything about it. We just we just wanted to convince people that it was a real myth here in Reno, uh, that our, our version was. So I just started talking to the camera and making it as if it was real. Most of it was just Mike and I coming up with it on the spot. <laughs> we were just- so you, You're just doing what those people were doing all those years ago when they were just adding a little bit to the story, weren't they? Yes. So that's kind of like the, um, you, you you know, that kind of, um, 
you know, one person where you all sit in a circle and you pass a, a, a is it password or something where you pass yeah. the uh, it, essentially just that, but just over hundreds of years. That's pretty <laughs> that's much great. what we were doing. Yeah. Um, that, that's so cool. As far as real research, um, it is so I'm so happy that you brought up Jaws because that's like my favorite horror movie of all time. Okay. Um, if you watch Tahoe Joe again, I want you to pay attention to how close it mirrors Jaws in terms of story. So oh, wow. the second half of Jaws is, you know, three guys going on a boat looking for the shark in the unknown. The second half of Tahoe Joe is three guys going into the woods looking for the Bigfoot. Um, we didn't show Tahoe Joe very much, just like they didn't show the shark in Jaws because we thought it was scarier just knowing he was out there versus showing him. Our Bigfoot suit in that first movie was falling apart left and right. And I know that Spielberg had problems with the shark literally being eaten by the salt water because they had to yeah. test it like that. And the fact that there's so many people doubting it as he went along, you know, that there was a literal revolt on set, wasn't there? So, yeah. you, you know, even as a filmmaker, I'm sure you can take kind of um, takes take a little bit of comfort in the fact that even Spielberg was getting... <laughs> challenged yes. a lot <laughs> absolutely um and so and then the, the last kind of thing we did was uh our crazy bigfoot guide who goes a little wild out there if you look at he's got big sideburns and stuff and we uh, we modeled him after quint so right uh, away I yeah so very shot. much it's my homage to jaws like big time um and i watched that movie i've seen it a million times but when i was going to make that second part of tahoe joe i watched jaws a lot from about the boat them getting on the boat onwards because i wanted to see how spielberg took a movie that is this big grand blockbuster scale there's hundreds of people on the beach and there's all these big things and then suddenly the movie necks down to three people for the remaining like hour yeah um, and it's such an interesting tonal shift, but it works so well. And so I wanted to pick up on those elements for us to be able to use that in Tahoe Joe. And a lot of it was the camaraderie and the different personalities and stuff. So that's why Mike and I wanted to have this very interesting conspiracy theorist type guy that was out there with us because it adds another element of danger, just like Quint does in Jaws. He, you can't yeah. really ever trust that Quint really cares about Brody and Hooper. No. He just, he, he's Ahab, you know, he just wants the fish. You've got uh, those three very distinct characters, haven't you? Yeah. And and it makes perfect sense now you say it. Strangely enough, um, where I used to live, our local pub was called the Robert Shaw because he was born in the area of West Horton near, near Baltimore. And it, you're a bit of a local folk hero kind of thing, just you know, somebody that gets mentioned a lot. Um, but that character is key in the same way as... You're, you're kind of guide. Well, I won't say guide. He's not really a guide in the sense of he, he's more of a hindrance, isn't he? Really, than a help. Yeah. But um, it, he he make, he builds. He makes your two characters come together a lot better. Uh, yeah. He's 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 really key to that success of their of their friendship. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so that was so fun for me to get to like go out into the woods and play you know, make believe with my friends uh, in this Bigfoot setting, but also really sort of mirror my favorite horror movie in, in at the yeah. same time um, without being like overtly blatant with it. Cause nobody really no, picks up know. on it until we say something and they're like, yes. Oh, that's so cool. Like, I, I get it. Yeah, exactly. I'm that person. I get it totally now. And I didn't, when I watched it and I must've seen Jaws ridiculous amount of times. Um, so yeah, it, it, but but now maybe that's why I just love Saho Joe so much. It, it, it <laughs> is so it's so subtle and it covers all those things that just set off that little tick box in my head as I'm watching a film that you don't even know what what it is, but you know you like it. Um, that's it. This is going to be the secret to my success from now on. We're just going to tap into movies we know people like and we'll <laughs> subliminally make them like ours. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because, yeah, I mean, the thing is, though, you wouldn't even have to say anything. Nobody would know. Nobody would know because I didn't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so thinking about, um, y y I was going to ask this near the end, but I love the, d the design. And I think Ghost is a good example of this. The, the, the logo, the post, uh, the logo of, of like... Um, uh, horror dads and a horror, a horror nerd uh, and the poster design for Ghost uh, and the, the other films, they're all so striking. They're really, really like, they look 
very, very, um, what's the word? Um, like a very big budget production. Tell mm-hmm. me a little bit about those designs. So uh, for the flock and for ghost, I had the same guy uh, do my uh, posters for me. And in fact, he's on your side of, of the water over there. His name's Tim uh, Smallman. He's got a, a company called Deathless Design. And uh, basically easiest guy ever to work with and super affordable. And I would go to him with some ideas and he would start throwing some concepts to me. And then we would just basically go from there. Um, for Ghost, I wanted like that classic, like I wanted like a band t-shirt low. You know, I wanted to look like an old Metallica album or something. This like yeah. retro 80s metal. Because Ghost is very much film like that. It it is not a serious movie. It is very much my love to like cheese ball Roger Corman style 80s, you know, movies and stuff. And I I watched Oh my gosh, I watched like every Jean Claude Van Damme movie and and a bunch of Steven Seagal low budget things just because that's how I wanted Ghost to play out is this like fun 80s romp. Um, And a lot of that was because we were so serious with our characters with Tahoe Joe and this very realistic world that Mike and I wanted to go play in this very much more kind of fantasy type realm with Ghost and and go like a totally different direction. Um, and so for the design, yeah, I wanted like bright colors, you know, and I love the idea of like lightning in the background because it always seemed like the 80s had a lot of that going on. Um, yeah, that neon kind of feel. Yes. And, yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it, it's really cool. Itself, I shot Ghost to be a very colorful movie too. There's a lot of scenes with graffiti in the background and uh, a lot of colors and stuff going on because I wanted to sort of make a movie where most of it took place in the daytime instead of at night, like most horror movies do. I wanted to have this like bright kind of fun vibe going. Um, Now the Tahoe Joe poster, I actually did that one on my own, just kind of the classic bloody footprint on white sheet. Uh, The problem was that poster that I actually love was not approved by Tubi or the distributors. And so they sort of made their own which was this the kind of generic forest background with a big foot footprint and, and it's fine mm-hmm. it does what it needs to do it's totally cool but uh that poster yeah, i that think I, I prefer yours is more striking i think the i white... loved it i thought it was yeah. such a cool poster and unfortunately um, i don't know what the big deal was i don't know why they didn't want it but it's just i'm starting to learn that when you when you start working with people that can get your movies out there you kind of start falling into their their rules and their yeah oh man sometimes that you know i've talked to people where they rename their movies and change you know change the kind of the layout of certain bits or the 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 sort of the synopsis doesn't match the actual film so people are only going to kind of be disappointed and you just think yeah just, just let the creator create and uh, they've obviously thought all about it a lot more than you have. Um, you can obviously take suggestions and how to market something, but to just change something on a whim seems really strange, really odd thing to do. Um, because, for example, I, I wonder if that's just because it was the, the different color palettes of what most horror films are like, which for me would make it stand out more. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think the big problem was that original poster it was Tubi and Plex and some of those streaming channels. Uh, they don't like the the harsh white like that because I think it blends into their. Uh, uh, oh yeah. I, I think when they go to show your little poster on their menus and stuff, it gets like washed out by their backgrounds. And I so I think for them it wasn't meeting their requirements, right? And right. Um, my distributor for Tahoe Joe, a really really nice dude named Michael Steinberg. He he's a big believer in in what we're doing. Um, That's good. he basically took control once the movie needed to get out there to make sure that it got to as many places as it could by following their rules. Um, mm-hmm. but one of the really cool things that he did as a distributor, that was like the opposite of what you said, where you get these guys that want to change things or take things out. Michael actually watched the first cut of Tahoe Joe and said, Hey, I think you should add a little more to your film at the end. So at the end of Tahoe Joe, when you see the, um, and this isn't a spoiler part, but when you see like the, the newspaper articles and the uh, fishing game uh, hair analysis results and all that kind of stuff that comes up, that's uh, actually all Michael that came up with that and said, you should, you Mm -hmm. should end the film with some more um, stuff to kind of 
allude that there could be further chapters and keep the audience, you know, like wondering. So he he came in big time and actually added that final probably 45 seconds that helps a lot. I think it ends the film yeah, it does. out that way. And it's great, isn't it? Because obviously now you are going into that, you know, going straight into that second film that it, yeah. it, it adds to that in a, in a really big way. So um, Ghost is your most recent released film i know you're working yeah. on so many different things um and i know you talked about that 80s feel so you've got um vernon wells in there who's been in so many like been in he was in commando so like we're talking peak 80s kind of you know action um yeah. oh, he's been he's, he's been in a, he's been in so, so many strange films so some that i i i really love and like he's, been, he's in stuart gordon's king of ants like yeah. that's that's a that's a really cool. I like anything that Stuart Gordon did, to be honest. Like Reanimator is just amazing. Um, but like things like Circuitry Man and things like that. Uh, that 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 bringing in somebody into your core group of of people, and and I guess the more you go along, the more you're going to be doing that. The budgets and kind of change and things like that. And you can get different people involved. Is that a challenge as well? Just kind of feeling like you're starting at step one with people you've just met or you know how, how does that kind of how did that work working on ghost with some different collaborators let's put it that way so um vernon that that whole situation was really cool a, a friend of mine named rob livings uh he did a, a found footage movie called infrared and then followed it up with one called the christmas tapes and the Christmas tapes is hilarious. It's like this anthology of found footage segments all around Christmas. And there's these like really funny horror Christmas moments. And then there's a couple of serious ones. And uh, Vernon is actually in that movie as this like very demented Santa Claus. And he was so good and he was loving and hamming it up. So Vernon was in Sacramento, which is a couple of hours from Reno where I'm at. And they were promoting the Christmas tapes. And Rob contacted me and he said, hey, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but would you want to try and bring somebody like Vernon Wells into one of your films at some point? Like, I can help you get that. And I'm like, you're telling me Bennett from like Commando and, and <laughs> yes. you know, Inner Space and Red Mohawk bad guy oh, from, course, yeah. from Mad Max, you know? I'm just like, what? Oh, yeah, I forgot Mad Max, man. Yeah. yeah. Mad Max 2, yeah, yeah. Y yeah. And so he's like, yeah, he goes, I think Vernon would do it. He had a lot of fun with us. And, and he said, I've got my studio here in Sacramento. He's going to be here. We could just, you know, he goes, you can direct everything you need, but I can be your, your like onset director and we'll bring you in virtually on a big screen. Um, if you're willing to, to, you know, allow us to shoot this thing. And I'm like, what do you mean? Am I willing? Like that is a huge favor to me. So wow. they talked to Vernon Vernon gives us this like unbelievably cheap day rate so we could film this scene with him. Uh, Rob is actually a teacher at uh, a company called Futures Explored, and they, they make films with um, adults who have various disabilities, like mental handicaps or physical disabilities that want to get into filmmaking. So it's this it's such like a, a beautiful charity type thing. It's a it's a wonderful cause that they have anyway. That sounds great. Vernon very much wanted to work with those those folks so they could have somebody like him at their studio and give them that experience. He wanted to help out our cause because what I do with Horror Nerd on my side uh, is we work with war veterans and many of them use uh, acting as a therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and that actually started when Michael, who was, as we spoke about, you know, was a Green Beret, was telling me that a lot of the horrible things he saw in his line of work and, and still sees as a uh, Mike actually works um, as like an anti uh, child sex trafficking, you know, task force guy or like anti child porn and stuff. He busts pedophiles and takes them down. Oh, wow. The problem with that amazing work is he also has to see a lot of that horrible stuff. So for yeah. him getting to come on to a movie set and run around with Bigfoot or, you know, play ghost, or whatever, it's like a, a mental break for him. Yeah, um, that. yeah. But we started uh, learning that there were other crazy. people that could use the same therapy to, to deal with their stuff. So most of Ghost was actually comprised of law enforcement, uh, war veterans, or first responders like firefighters and paramedics and stuff that were actually in our movie. It was so cool. 
Yeah, so, that, that, that was the first time that we actually started talking online, wasn't it? it was because that's yes. really what piqued my interest. My, my day job is in inclusion. And I was like, wow, this is so interesting and so valuable. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and then it obviously it made me want to go and watch the films and I did and I, and I binged them all in a row. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it's testament to yourself as well and your kind of inclusive nature. I know you're putting it onto other people as well, but it's just fantastic that you're doing that um, because you need an outlet. Everybody yeah. need, needs an outlet. If you, whatever trauma it is, whatever hard hardship you've gone through, you need to be able to express that, don't you? And I think, um to be in your movie must be a wonderful way for 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 those people to to feel that they are expressing themselves and getting to do that uh, and thank you for doing that for one and also um is that something that's going to you're going to carry forward now you you've you've done more of that is that something that Absolutely. you can see yourself doing yeah yeah we're going to we're going to make it a thing where you know we're not always going to have uh main characters that way or we're not always going to fill our entire set with with um you know people that have to have that background but we're no. our mission moving forward is every movie moving forward will have somebody if not multiples involved in the in the production like we are always going to have somebody that fits that bill there so they can use what we're doing to help themselves and and um you know, the mission's just bigger than than making the film. I think seeing people get on set and really having a chance to um, be somebody else for a couple of hours and see them smiling and laughing and knowing that they just got off of a shift where maybe they dealt with a car accident and had to say something horrible, or maybe they have struggled with some things for a while because of, you know, their time in the service. But then they get to come over with what we're doing and have this hilarious time fighting demons in ghosts. And, and it's so far removed from anything that they really dealt with. Um, yeah. I can see it. I see on set the laughter and the joy and it's just, it, it makes it so much more worthwhile for oh, me. Man, the, it's, substantial, it's, it's a substantial thing that you're doing. And, and I think for, for me as a viewer, knowing that, I buy into it more because I kind of understand the morals and the the ideas behind what you're doing, but also it doesn't take away from the fun. So the people that are in the films, the the they're chosen sensitively to match the roles. It's not yes. a kind of community project with a with a film at the side of it. it it's a film where the right people uh, are chosen to to do the right roles, and but also with a with a strong ethos of inclusion, which. Yeah. which you know is is is, is outstanding I, I, and and I've really I've really enjoyed seeing the journey certainly through the four films and it's allowed me to kind of open up and see other things that you've been involved in and different people you've worked with um it feels like a movement and I really enjoy that I think it's I think it's great to be to be able to see that um as an outsider just to kind of for, for me to be able to see that it must be great even better for you to be at the center of it and, and just li living your normal life alongside that as well. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's where Horror Dads came from. Was, uh, it was myself mm. and some other filmmakers that were all balancing filmmaking life with being, you know, parents and having regular jobs on the side, you know, as a main part of our life. And we're like, we were so tired of people saying, you know, that they had excuses, right? And it's like, oh, I wish I could be a filmmaker, but I don't have the time. And I'm like, what do you think I do? I got kids yeah. and I got a, a job too, but we're making it work. And so when we all came together to form Horror Dads, that was sort of the basis of it was finding other people who were like us um, and just using each other as a support system. And then we became such good friends that we started producing things together and we started wanting to help other creators out. And uh, so it's like, you know, I guess I'll just use this as a great transition into what we're doing right now with Horror Dad. Well, which is... I, you beat me to it. I was just about to say the same <laughs> thing. and you, you saved me the job. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So split screen, uh, which is our, our newest thing that we're doing, uh, is a combination of fellow Horror Dad, uh, Joshua Brucker, and then myself. And we each directed a one hour film uh, and we're going to package them together as like a double feature. And uh, it still has a lot of our regular things that we're doing. Like I've got my kind of veteran focus thing going on. We brought in a, a 
female Marine to be one of the characters in my um, segment and, and kind of getting her first acting um, gig going, which was really cool. Uh, and then Josh has got other Horror Dads members, Hunter Nino, who founded with us. He's a main actor in his uh, film. Um, and we, we've been pretty sparse on details, so I'm not going to go crazy here, but I am going to give you uh, like the first public kind of description here on what we're doing because we haven't told anybody a lot of this stuff yet. So basically, Split Screen is um, it's a double feature project. Uh, two films, two directors, and uh, we're going to have um, this kind of a, a host character who will be uh, opening the film and then segueing between the two films and closing it out. And he's kind of our our lineage, or our linkage, I should say, between the, the two movies. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Josh's film is called The Illinois Valley Murder Tapes, and it's very much based on... Uh, he loves the Poughkeepsie tapes, that movie. It freaks me out. And he loves that movie. So Josh is making a very scary, serious, uh, slasher kind of film. Um, basically about these podcasters who get involved with a murderer who is sending them his footage, uh, like kind of how the Zodiac was sending stuff to, you know, the newspapers and, and these podcasters get way in over their heads. Uh, and so that's kind of where that story goes. Mine is like ripped from the current headlines. It's called Gray's the Nevada Alien Incident. And it is like all about this UFO stuff going on right now and all these people talking about alien stuff in the government. And um, so we did a movie with an alien and I got to work with a full alien suit that is the coolest creature I've worked with so far nice. in a movie. It turned out so amazing. Um and it's really a, a kind of a, a story about this paranoid guy um, who had this encounter with an alien, like a home invasion type thing. And now he's worried that the government is trying to get him uh, because he has footage of it. And uh, so it's like kind of these two stories, the, the government and the alien and who's really the bad, you know, the, who, they're both scary. But what's the worst entity, you know, here and um, without spoiling too much, um, I will say that my segment, the alien one is uh it is in the tahoe joe universe so that's going to be a fun oh, awesome a really fun connection when people see uh how connected and, and where we did that connection uh oh man that's so cool yeah that's it's so going to be cool. awesome i'm i'm super excited about it uh split yeah. screen is um going to be the first movie that josh and i try and push completely independently where we're not going to look for a distributor to help us put it out there we're going to self-distribute. We're going to run it wherever we can. He's in Illinois. Uh, I'm over in Nevada. So at least we've kind of got two parts of the country covered there. Yeah. Um, and we will, uh, we're just, we're going to push it. We're going to try and get the movie out by like around Christmas or New Year's. And uh, Oh, wow. You, you, don't, you don't hang around, do you? No, you, we, not, no. we do not mess around. We get going no. and we just... We just well, that's it. it. When, normally when I interview someone, it's like 1997. 2000 2005 with you it's like 2001 2002 2002 uh, sorry 2001 <laughs> 2021 2021 2022 2022 2023 2023 yeah. you're like going and going and going and and i'll i'll just say this as well like a compliment about the acting side of things i think creatively how you've done things like the character of monk and ghost now the silent character is very cleverly done so you've got that need for the camera but also it makes a really compelling character um i i think that creativity that's a really good example of the creativity that makes me really excited about seeing split screen now um tahoe joe 2 all the other things you're involved in i am on board i'm really on board and really excited i'm gonna put links to everything underneath the uh the video i really want people to go out and check out your films if they if they w- want to do the same as me and watch them all in a row and and do that, I think that's a really good way to get into a filmmaker. But equally, um, I'm just unashamedly I have such love for Tahoe Joe and that universe. But I liked I got something out of every one of your films, and particularly um, Ghost is such a departure. So people need to kind of see that to show 
you know, that kind of journey into doing something very, very different from all the other films. Yeah. Um, so I just, just a huge thank you for spending this time. Is there anything else you want to kind of just, um, that we haven't covered that you feel like you'd kick me or, you know, oh, why didn't you let me, is there anything you want to mention before, before we finish? Because honestly, you've been so gracious and answered all my questions. And sometimes you've answered them before I've asked them. You've, we've kind of had a bit, bit of a mind meld, so it's worked quite well. Um, <laughs> so is there anything else that you want to kind of share or someone else or something you want to promote or even if it's not, not your own work? Well, I would just say that, uh, you know, I split screen will be coming, you know, at the end of this year. But before that, uh, I did produce with Horror Dads, Josh Brucker's next movie called The Woodman, which will be coming out. Uh, I think they're shooting for like around Thanksgiving ish. They're hoping um, The Woodman is Josh's sophomore effort. His first film he did was called Mothman, which came out last year. And you wouldn't even think the same director did it. It's, it's such a big jump. Uh, and I it's so fun to be a producer on a movie and kind of watch this movie be made from the ground up. And, and I got to, you know, Josh even was sending me like some dailies and stuff. And I got to do some special effects work, which was really fun on, on the Woodman. Mm. But I have sat and watched that movie as a fan, not just as somebody who worked on it or because I know him, it's a genuinely fun movie and it's so great. Um, and so that one will be coming out too this year, The Woodman. And I want That's everybody. Going on my list. Who, I want everybody who likes Tahoe Joe <laughs> to <laughs> pay attention to uh, some some Easter egg things in The Woodman too. So uh, I'll just leave you with that. It's just the Dylan Brown expanded universe. Yeah, well, <laughs> the, the horror <laughs> dad universe. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I guess, yeah, I guess. Um, don't you don't yeah <laughs> don't, don't don't i don't want to i don't want to make you into some sort of megalomaniacal uh <laughs> i don't think that's gonna happen dylan to be honest um because yeah, I, i've got such a good good group of guys around me and we all keep yeah. each other really grounded you know and um josh's josh's woodman movie is going to create some buzz i think it's uh it may end up getting the biggest release of any of our movies because he's, he's got a really good producer on board. Who's going to help push that thing who I will probably use for my future stuff too. It's just mm -hmm. that uh, I had already sort of wrapped ghost by the time uh, Louie his his name had come on board to help with Josh's thing. And I've seen the stuff that Louie's doing and I'm like, Oh, we're, we're this close to getting out there big time. And I think the Woodman might be that first one, which I'm super excited about because it's going to help us further uh, with what we're doing. And um, oh, I'm just, I'm, I'm super blessed to be doing what I'm doing. And I've got a really supportive family who allows me to do this stuff on the side. And then guys like you who bring us on to, to do this coverage, like we cannot thank you enough for allowing us to have these conversations. So no, it's a privilege. It's a privilege because I that that's the whole reason I started doing this was initially my, my day job is interviewing people essentially about their roles and their their kind of um their role in education and, and then kind of reflecting back the things that I find inspiring and and they, they get an award at the end of it and it's it's a really great thing to be able to do and i was just like well i love horror i kind of want to do the same thing that's all it is really I, i'm more interested in hearing other people's voices than my own it has inspired me to get back into writing a little bit i won't lie but only just for just for fun um but it's so cool and all i can do is just wish you great success and anything i can do even in a small way is 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 uh thanks enough so no that's really that's lovely um it's been absolute privilege pleasure speaking to you dylan and i'm sure we'll speak again in the future thank you so much um and i, I yeah I, everything all the links and everything are going to be below i want people to get on board horror dads get in, get involved watch all these films buy them get the t-shirt <laughs> Uh, thanks so much, Matt. I really appreciate it. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you.